This is Troy Van Valkenburg talking to you today about the progression of World War II, uh, what it means for Europe, why the Axis powers lost, uh, what technological advances were made during this time period, uh, what leaders we saw come to power, what ideologies we saw, and some of the major conflicts and offensives that shaped the war and uh, thereafter. And now, the leaders that we saw shape this war. Coming from both sides, um, the Allied Powers, the United Kingdom, the United States, Soviet Union, we'll talk about that in a little bit, there's a little bit of complication to that. France and Poland was thrown in here as a nod. Um, on the Axis side, we have Italy and Germany as fascist powers and Japan over in the Far East. Um, but that's the Pacific theater of the war. We won't need this for Euro. That's just um, an overview. So as far as leaders go, we have Adolf Hitler, the uh, Chancellor of Germany, uh, who rose to power through the 30s. We have Winston Churchill, the now Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, following Neville Chamberlain and Neville Chamberlain's uh, appeasement to Hitler. We'll go over that soon. We have Joseph Stalin highlighted here in an orangish sort of yellow. Um, and then we have Franklin Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States. And again, the reason that we have Stalin highlighted in a yellow instead of red as Axis powers and blue as Allied powers is because there's more to that relationship than just black and white. Uh, later, yes, the, um, the Soviet Union is an Allied power and it is noted as an Allied power but we will talk about that in a moment. Um, other leaders that shaped the war, uh, we have Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator in Italy, who was allied, allied with um, Adolf Hitler. Uh, Hideki Tojo, the prime minister of Japan as well as Japanese imperial general. Um, Charles de Gaulle, he was the resistance leader of Free France after the fall of France, um, as well as a notable French general. He was also Following the war, he was also the um, uh, the first leader of the French Republic following um, the end of World War II. Um, and then, of course, on the right, we have Harry Truman, uh, the next president following uh, Roosevelt's death towards the end of the war. Now, now we're going to get into general officers, notable leaders. Um, these are the people that weren't necessarily the main, the major. Uh, leaders of the countries, but they played pivotal parts within their militaries. Um, so Hermann Göring uh, was Hitler's designated second-in-command. Uh, he was also the German commander of the Luftwaffe, the, um, the German Air Force, and he was instrumental in the early days of the war. Um, we also have Adolf Eichmann, the uh, German officer in charge of Holocaust logistics. Um, he was in charge of who went to what camps, what was where, um, basically moving around all of these people unbeknownst to the Allies. Uh, we have George Patton on the Allied side of the United States. Um, he was a very successful and notable general amongst American troops, old blood and guts. Um, there's actually a lot of movies and popular film about him. Uh, and then we have Dwight Eisenhower. He was the head commander of American forces in Europe um, and then later 34th president of the United States after uh, Truman. Continuing on our officers here, we have Isoroku Yamamoto, the Japanese fleet the rear fleet admiral behind the Battle of Midway, as well as the attack on Pearl Harbor. So he was a major um, general for the Japanese Empire. He was actually later shot down in the war. Uh, his, um, his plane was shot down, and that came as a major blow to um, Japanese morale. Next we have Zhukov, a uh, major a major Soviet officer. Um, he was actually quite trusted by Stalin. Um, he was a career Red Army officer um, and he was the primary defensive officer during the German invasion of the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa. We will get to that later. Um, on the British side of things we have Bernard Montgomery who was a major uh, player in the North Africa campaigns during World War II. Uh, there's also another slide on that. We'll get to that shortly. Um, and later, he was the commander-in-chief of the British, British Association of the Rhine following the war. Um, uh, Messe, 
the successor of Erwin Rommel's Italo tank, German tank army, uh, fought against the Greeks in the early days of the war. Um, I think he was also, I believe he was the most respected and the uh, most notable of the Italian generals during the Second World War. Now, now we have um, Heinrich Himmler, uh, the later second in command after Goring. Um, he's considered the mind behind the Holocaust and the Nazi SS. Um, so he was the head of the German secret police. And aside from that, he was, um, he was a major German official. Uh, Reinhard Heydrich was a high-ranking officer of the Nazi SS. Uh, he was a major contributor to the Holocaust, and he was a major intimidator of the German people. Douglas MacArthur, on the American side of things, the commander of U.S. forces in the Pacific, in Asia, and he's often associated with the U.S.-Philippines campaign. Uh, we can't really talk a whole lot about him because he wasn't on this side of the war, but uh, he was a major U.S. figure. Now, Erwin Rommel was uh, a major general in the North Africa campaign and popularly became known as the Desert Fox. We'll talk a little bit about him later on. Um, I think there is one more. Nope. The innovations of the Second World War included the following here. There's a lot more, uh, but here are some of the main uh, major technological advancements. The pressurized cabin, which hadn't seen use up until the later part of the war, uh, the B-29 Super Fortress was the first plane to, succe to successfully create a pressurized cabin for its crew members where you no longer have to wear a uh, oxygen mask at high altitudes uh, and it creates a more comfortable environment for the crew. Um, aircraft carriers became widely used, uh, most, mo more specifically in the Pacific Theater. Uh, armored and fast troop transport, as we saw with German Blitzkrieg and even further into the war. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Semi-automatic and automatic weaponry. Although we saw some of those advancements come into play in World War I, um, more effective weapons were developed for World War II. Uh, bombers, fighters, and reconnaissance aircraft. Although they were first seen primarily uh, in World War I, very sparse. Very, very sparse. The um, the technology that came before World War One was not yet uh, effective enough to put into combat. So a lot of the World War One bombers, fighters, any of that that was actually developed, um, they were very, very primitive. Um, actually, they used to they used to throw rocks or not not always rocks, but they used to throw hand grenades. They used to throw um, anything they could really do damage with out of planes. Um, and those were considered bombers. Uh, now we actually have planes that are built specifically with the intent of uh, leveling ground in cities. Uh, radar and sonar is developed first by the Allies, and that actually becomes a contributing factor to the Battle of Britain and some later conflicts. Uh, primitive computing systems, jet engines were developed later in the war. Effective tanks, uh, as seen here on the right, we have the German Tiger II, and the American M4 Sherman. Now, as far as technology goes, the German, the German war machine cranked out some actually pretty uh, magnificent technology. Uh, the German Tiger II and a lot of these other German tanks that were cranked out during the war were amazing tanks, and they were amazing pieces of machinery. However, they were very, very, very hard to build, and they didn't they didn't crank out of factories just quite as fast as the American M4s or any of the other Allied tanks. So in the end, it became a matter of who had more. Um, as far as the atomic bomb goes, that's more Pacific Theater, and that's an end game. Uh, penicillin was also developed during this time, and that was a major uh, medical advance. Now we move on to our major conflicts and major offensives of the European theater. Now, beginning of the war, before the war even begins, before the invasion of Poland, which triggers World War II, Germany annexes, through fairly legal means, Austria and Czechoslovakia. 
there is practically a takeover of both governments. Uh, Great Britain permits it because there is no show of violence. Um, the Nazis f fairly just infiltrate the government and take over. Next we have the invasion of Poland. Now this is considered the breaking point of World War II. It is at this point that Great Britain realizes that the policy of appeasement is not going to work and Chamberlain realizes that we're off to war again. Following this we have the invasion of Denmark and Norway. Both fall relatively quickly. And then it's through the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and on through Belgium. And then very, very shortly after, France falls. A year after, Greece and Yugoslavia fall to Nazi Germany and Italy. Now, they weren't necessarily the first choices of the German Empire to stretch down here. But, um, in the fighting, Italy realizes, oh, we can grab land, and we want some territorial gain as well. So Italy invades Yugoslavia um, and Greece down through this area here, and can't quite do it, so Germany has to step in and aid them. Now, now we're going to start talking about actual operations and actual parts of the war. The German invasion of the West, um, as a result of the pact between Hitler and Stalin, Poland is divided in September of 1939. Um, this is usually called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, uh, the German-Soviet Pact, the Hitler-Stalin Pact. Uh, all you really need to know is that it's the pact between Germany and the Soviet Union, basically saying we're splitting up Poland. Germany gets the eat. Ger I'm, I'm sorry, Germany gets the West, and the Soviet Union gets the East. Germany invades with roughly 1.5 to 2 million soldiers and armored vehicles. Um, they employ Blitzkrieg, which is in the next slide here. We'll talk about that in a second. They begin September 1st. However, the Soviets enter 17 September of 1939. They bring slightly less troops. Poland, at this point, is already on its knees, and Poland falls very, very easily. This event, obviously, as I talked about in the slides prior, triggers World War II and the intervention of the Allies. German Blitzkrieg, a.k.a. the Blitz. Um, towards the beginning of the war, the Germans found it easy and rather effective to employ a rush tactic. Uh, they would rush and crush defending forces before allowing them to mobilize, taking out command, and destroying the enemy before practically they knew what was going on. Um, there was a heavy use of armored vehicles and heavy bombing. Um, night raids and bombing by German Luftwaffe left the cities relatively defenseless and in mass ruins. Looking to the French side of the conflict, we have the Maginot Line, uh, built by the French to repel the Germans, and the line did not cover the border with Belgium to avoid angering them. Um, the French officials believed that it would deter attack long enough to mobilize the French forces through Belgium and counterattack Germany. Um, it created a false sense of security for French officials, as we can see towards the southern end of the line, there are very, very strong fortifications, however, along Belgium, very weak. Now that we're looking at the Belgium campaign, the battle lasts barely 18 days in May of 1940. King Leopold refuses to leave his country and his troops, and his advisors strongly warn him that he must vacate the country. Um, he refuses, and he later surrenders his forces to the Germans. He's actually referred to as the Coward King, the Rat King. Um, he's despised by the Allies um, as he leaves their flanks open to German invasion. Um, while the Allies are distracted by this initial assault, um, referred to as Case Yellow in the north, the Germans launch another assault through the Ardennes to the south, cutting off Allied forces up to the English Channel. And with this, Belgium is effectively lost.
But aside from that, it did include the first tank conflicts of the war. Following the German invasion of France, in May of 1940, 300,000 to 350,000 French troops are evacuated from Nazi Belgium. Um, German armored and infantry divisions waited for the command to assault the beaches. Hitler never gives the order. Little boats are used to transport fleeing French troops. They're actually pretty small. They're, a lot of them are fishing boats or small military boats that really aren't designed for this mass movement of people. Um, it comes as a show of restraint for the Germans, um, as German warplanes could have easily leveled the beaches. Uh, Hitler later stated that his rationale for not crushing the evacuation force was that he believed if he allowed this display of mercy, the British might negotiate a peace. The fall of France comes just slightly later. Uh, German armored units push through the Netherlands, Belgium, and the Ardennes. French forces become scattered, the army collapses, and the Nazis take Paris with very, very little resistance. Um, the second armistice is signed between German and French officials, dividing France into three zones of occupation. The German North and West, Italian Southeast, and the French government. And it's kind of a joke. that it, it has no power, and that's pretty much, it's just there. Curfews are imposed upon the Parisian citizens. Uh, they resent the Nazi occupation, but they do very little to resist. The Battle of Britain, the, uh, the German assault on British homeland, um, it kind of scares the British people as the German, the arm of the German war machine reaches out. Uh, the Luftwaffe is a very, very strong force. Um, they come with the intention of bringing Britain to its knees to negotiate a peace. Uh, the English fight back with nearly 2,000 aircraft. Uh, however, they have code breakers on their side, um, and they're able to decode messages from the German Luftwaffe and kind of get the one up on the German Air Force. Um, they have to deal with the bombing of their own factories and industrial centers, and later they, the Germans move to uh, civilian targets. The Germans launch this, uh, this aerial assault because they know that if they were to launch a seaborne assault across the English Channel that their numbers would be decimated. Uh, the Royal Navy is I, the mightiest navy in the world um, next to the United States. And really their main goal during this entire assault is to inflict, m inflict maximum damage, whether that be collateral damage or military damage, um, to force English into submission. Um, it ends with 50,000 civilian deaths, uh, 1,500 Royal Air Force pilots are killed, and 2,500 Germans are killed before the Germans pull back. Uh, Hitler halts the assault, pulls back, and starts to bomb civilians um, before being pushed out. Um, and this is the first major defeat for German forces. Up to this point, the Germans had been previously unopposed and unmatched. Uh, Operation Barbarossa in June of 1941 brings the intervention of the Soviet Union into the Allied ring. Um, the German advance of 150 divisions, 3,000 tanks, and thousands of miles in formation signals that Germany has just betrayed the Soviet Union. The early excess for the German army was not to be continued as winter sets in and the Soviets counterattack. Uh, the Germans are initially heavily, equ heavily equipped, but later unequipped. Um, they come with guns, tanks, and everything they believe they need to take Russian territory before winter sets in. However, once it does, weapons jam, trucks sink into the mud, and soldiers freeze. Um, they didn't have coats, their weapons would jam, they couldn't fire, Tanks, tank tracks would virtually just freeze up, and the tank was then useless uh, for little more than a shelter. Um, it was a major defeat for the German army, 
and it opens a two-front war that contributes to resource issues for Hitler. And it is often debated whether or not things could have changed had Hitler not opened up another front. The Second Battle of El Alamein, um, another major conflict, uh, this time across the deserts of North Africa, specifically Egypt. Um, it was near the El Alamein Railway Halt, therefore the name. Uh, the battle fought between British forces under Montgomery and Axis forces under Erwin Rommel became a decisive victory for allies in North Africa. And being so, this marked the end of Axis threats to Egypt and the Suez Canal and Middle Eastern oil fields. Now that we've cut off the oil to the German war machine, that cripples production of German German-made weapons and arms, um, as well as a moral blow, morale blow, to the Axis powers. The Battle of Stalingrad is part of the German-Russian offensives. Uh, the German army invades Stalingrad, giving full power to taking the city. Um, being the fact that it bears Stalin's name is understood on both sides as very, very, very important. Um, the Germans refer to the conflict as Rattenkrieg, uh, Rat War, as soldiers literally dove from hole to hole, from complex to complex, from building to building, and it was a very dirty conflict. The, uh, the Germans end up taking the center complex of the city, um, but it's a very, very short-lived victory as they find themselves surrounded in the surrounding suburbs and uh, town areas. Once encircled, the Germans are told by Hitler himself um, and by his advisors to hold their ground at all costs. Uh, the Germans resent this. They don't want to be there. Um, morale drops. Uh, supplies run low. Um, and later, a failed rescue mission and supply drop lead to the surrender of remaining German forces in Stalingrad. Um, the defeat came as a major low blow to the German morale and led Hitler to greatly distrust his command structure. Um, the tide of war now shifts again in favor of the Allies as the Soviets, Soviets push back. Um, the Italian campaign launched by the Allies starting in July of 1943. Um, this is practically D-Day number, number two before D-Day. Um, with reluctance from the American command structure as they didn't believe it would be effective, uh, the Allies plan an amphibious invasion of Italy from the Mediterranean to divert German forces from eastern and western fronts. Um, Germans fight viciously alongside the Italians, and they make the Allies pay greatly for every mile, and as they stated, every inch taken. Uh, it's a lot of heavy mountain fighting, but eventually the fascist regime of Mussolini falls, and a provisional government friendly to the Allies, is set up under Marshal Pietro Bedoglio. <laughs> Even after the fall of Italy, Germans fight on until the fall of Berlin and the end of the war. Um, Winston Churchill actually refers to Italy um, as the soft underbelly of Europe, and he believes that if they invade through Italy, open up a third front, that it will give uh, support to the eastern and western fronts as the Germans will divert forces, um, thinning, thinning the herd, so to speak. And now comes Operation Overlord and uh, D-Day. Uh, the assault operation launched on the beaches of Normandy in northern France. Um, it is considered one of the largest amphibious assault operations in modern history. Um, and although heavily fortified, German command was expecting an attack from across the English Channel, um, as that would have been the prime location. Uh, nearly 160,000 Allied troops stormed the beaches, and the use of paratroopers became a paramount way for the Allies to insert strategic, insert and take strategic points behind enemy lines. Um, and it's, it is a popular topic for film and movie production, thus saving Private Ryan and several others. And now, moving on, and we have a map of what the beaches looked like that day. So if we were looking at where the Germans thought the attack was coming from, it'd be more up here, um, a little out of sight here. But they weren't expecting it here. 
they were expecting it more up to the north side, the north west, sorry, northeast from uh, where the Allies actually landed. And as you can see here, there were strategic locations where uh, airborne units were dropped. Um, and the Allied landing forces consisted of um, American, British, and Canadian forces. Now here's, here's a fun one to discuss. This is something that really isn't a major thing that you need to know, but uh, it's just kind of one of those fun fact things. Uh, the July plot, actually a, not a whole lot is known about it. It's not really popularized, but it was the plot to kill Hitler, um, and it wasn't done by the Allies. Uh, the failure of the German army to sustain war causes some of those within to plan a coup of Hitler's regime, beginning with his assassination. Uh, the intended explosion, which is planted in a briefcase bomb at a meeting, um, only kills four, and Hitler is not among them. And as a result, it is very quickly found out, and Hitler becomes extremely distrustful of his command structure, and once the conspirators are found out, they're very, very quickly eliminated, uh, either blackmailed, publicly executed, poison, any of which. Uh, he becomes extremely distrustful of his command structure, um, but he believes that his survival of the explosion was a result of divine intervention and that his mission is yet to be completed. Uh, conspirators, as I said, are blackmailed or executed, some of which were very, very, very prominent figures t to the German public, and they had to be eliminated quietly. Operation Market Garden comes in September of 1944. Uh, the Allies are now uh, have now established a foothold in Europe um, as they're working their way across France. Uh, the Allies launch an offensive to consolidate and break through into German heartland. Uh, they're up by the Rhine River at this point. Uh, paratroopers are dropped to establish footholds on key points over rivers. Um, so they're dropped along bridges and towns that would be very, very, very good places to have troops and very, uh, very easily fortified uh, places to build up arms to launch an assault into Germany. Uh, Allied forces are surrounded and overrun. Um, it ends the hope of ending the war by Christmas. Uh, paratrooper forces struggle to mobilize. Um, they struggle to find their equipment. They struggle to meet up with artillery divisions, and they're they're either pulled out, killed, or missing. Battle of the Bulge comes just a few months later. Um, it's the last major push for Nazi Germany, as they can see the war is very quickly ending and not moving in their favor. Um, it's launched through the Ardennes. And it comes as a major surprise to the Allies, who had not expected such a last-ditch effort. Uh, the Germans sacrificed numerous troops and machinery in an effort to split and divide Allied forces. As we can see here, um, Allied forces up to this point had actually been further up, but are pushed back by the Germans. Um, and what the Germans hoped to do here is what they had done earlier in the war. Um, they hoped to get up to the English Channel and cut off Allied forces on both sides and cut communication. However, it doesn't work. Coming towards the end of the war now, we have April and May of 1945 and the Soviet siege of Berlin. Uh, the Soviets have made their way all the way into German heartland. Germany is on its knees, and German forces are outnumbered nearly 3 to 1 as the Soviets cross the line into Berlin. Uh, it entails a lot of vicious street fighting, as we can see here in the picture, literally pulling Germans out of homes and pulling them out of uh, manholes and anywhere else they can hide. Uh, the young and the old are forced to fight for the German Reich, um, and really it's, it's, it's over and the Germans know it. And Hitler directs most of the German forces himself. Uh, Berlin surrenders on May 2nd, 1945, and Germany surrenders in, in total, unconditionally, five days later. Here, we're going to back up here for a second. This marks a key point as the Soviets liberated Berlin before its post-war division. 
And now moving on, uh, Hitler, after the loss of his nation to the Allies above him, commits suicide with his late wife, Eva Braun. And as I noted here, Blondie the dog doesn't even survive. Uh, Hitler was very, very dear, near and dear with um, what we would call a German shepherd. Um, he actually has the dog euthanized uh, very quickly when he learns that the Allies are going to overrun Berlin. Um, he doesn't trust that the Allies would wouldn't torture the animal or himself, and he didn't feel that he wanted to experience the humiliation and the death that Mussolini had found. And speaking of which, Mussolini, after his regime fell, was executed by a firing squad by his own people, publicly, and then he was paraded around. Uh, Hideki Tojo, on the other side of the war, uh, attempts suicide before trial by the Allies. He does not succeed, and he's later hung for war crimes, as Hitler would have been. Um, the Nuremberg trials, and subsequently the deaths of hiding pranking Nazi officials. The aftermath, we see the Potsdam Conference, which is called from July through August of 1945 between the Big Three, Churchill, Stalin, and Truman. Um, that splits up Germany into uh, zones of occupation, splits up Berlin, um, and that really sets up for Cold War. Um, Germany now faces a second period of demilitarization and reparations. Um, however, it's dealt with differently from the Allies this time. Instead of making it almost impossible for the Germans, the Allies actually occupy uh, Germany as, um, as it's split into zones of occupation. Um, then comes the liberation of POW camps, the discovery of the final solution, and its fallout, as the Allies had not previously known. Um, as German command crumbles, the order is given for unconditional surrender. France, Belgium, and others are liberated by the Western Allies. On May 8, 1945, news breaks to the Allied nations from across Europe that it's over. And it is dubbed VE Day, Victory in Europe. The Allied Agreement for Military Occupation and Reconstruction of Germany. There's a dispute between the Soviets and the Western powers. Russia, formerly Soviet Union, now wants the Germans to pay very, very dearly for invading their homeland yet again, and they do not want to see Germany rebuilt as a major European power. They want to see Germany crushed. Um, however, Britain, France, and the United States want to see that Germany is reestablished properly and that um, the Allies will oversee that reparation and the Allies will oversee that rebuilding of the German government. And at this point, that's it. That's, uh, that's World War II in a nutshell in a half hour. And uh, I hope this somewhat helped, and if you need to, look it over again.